first event in Red Deer for TEDx. I think that's pretty amazing. I'm excited because I'm a newcomer to Red Deer, so I get to connect with you guys. So, and Peter is not here, he hogs the stage. So, <laughs> I can say bad things about him uh, while he's not here. And I'm sure he'll say bad things about me. But I want to start with the whole notion of ideas and what makes us human. And I'm going to talk about what makes us human. I'm going to talk about technology. But I looked at the, the menu and all the speakers that are here. It's such a fantastic, diverse group of people who are attending. So for the organizers, wow, what a collection you've got. And I get to start, so I'm very lucky to. Thank you. So let's begin with looking at um, what makes us human, first of all. Let me take you back to a few thousand years, maybe 130, 140,000 years. The Neanderthals roamed this planet. And along with them, so did we, the Homo sapiens. And along with them, so were these the actual real little people, three feet tall, off the island of Java in Flores. They were the real hobbits. These guys had language. The Neanderthals get a bad rep. They had language. They had music. They had paintings. They buried their dead. They had a rich diet. And Ramachandran, in his book, The Telltale Brain, tells us about these people who roamed this earth along with us. And yet they died. And we didn't. What happened? Why was that? These little hobbits slayed 20-foot dragon lizards. They roamed the oceans. They had boats. The Neanderthals did all kinds of amazing things. They had language that was more complex than ours. And yet they're dead. Did we outcompete them? Did we beat them to death? What did we do? So my question is, what made us survive and them not? And so in his book, Ramachandran, he just published this book, is incredible description of the evolution of the brain. And it leads into my next point. Not just humanity, but that part of our brain that Stephen, your cat, does not have. Let me tell you. Maybe some of the chimps have that. But we have outcompeted and made ourselves so incredibly amazing. And we think, we believe from a scientific point of view, this reason is there's a very specific set of circuitry in our brains that allows us to use our own self-image and then look at what you're doing and what you're doing and what you're thinking and about to do and predict what's going to come next. And it's done through connection of my circuit with yours. So that's the first idea I want to share with you. And that is that the circuitry of connection in our brains, which I believe is the reason why we're alive and the real little hobbits are dead. Actually, the CIA might be hiding them. <laughs> Maybe they have weapons of mass artistry or something. <laughs> Who knows? That circuitry is bound up by a group of neurons. Neurons are brain cells called mirror cells. So when I watch you or you pick up a glass of water or about to say something or you laugh, I am internalizing what that means. And I am feeling the E word. It's called empathy. And empathy is where I'm trying to put myself in your shoes and try to understand and predict what will happen next. And that, I believe, and I believe other scientists who believe, was the beginning of our superiority. Fast forward, right? So empathy, I haven't described what it is yet, but I sort of have from a 
evolutionary biological point of view. But what I'd like to share with you now is fast forward 1960s, late 1960s, Fred Hoff of Intel and other computer scientists produced the most incredible thing called the microchip. And that led to the onset and proliferation of global digital networks. So I've given you one idea of what makes us, I believe, human, and be moral, and be aware of our environment, and do all those wonderful things, including what we're doing here today, sharing ideas. But now, I'm going to move on to the technology portion very quickly, and share with you what happened the last 30, 40 years. What happened? What happened was that everything and everybody potentially got connected to everything and everybody else. That's pretty darned amazing. From the little hobbits we may have slayed and the Neanderthals we left in their caves, in their fossilized forms. And here we are today, 30, 40 years on, where you can talk to people in Andorra and people in Antarctica, and we can see history as it happens. We can see Omar Gaddafi. Is he dead or is he alive? We don't know, but we're all following it, right? We saw the Twin Towers come down. We see history as a mini-series, and as Francis Karen Cross calls it, the death of distance. Everywhere is here, and we are everywhere. What an amazing accomplishment us humanoids have made, homo sapien. And the most fascinating thing of this technology that connects us to everything and everyone also disconnects us. It has an amazing capacity to level the playing field for those who want to communicate with others. When I was doing my doctoral work, I had from the University of Alaska, uh, Dr. Jason Ola was my, on my advisory board, and he wrote a book, The Beast in the Electronic Jungle, something like that, and he talked about technology doing something amazing. He said that technology magnifies who we are, what we do, what we think. So if you want to consider this next idea, technology, if you are a great guitarist and you have an amplifier, the technology makes you sound wonderful. But if you're a somewhat shitty <laughs> guitarist, you sound really bad, right? And so it is with connection. Some of you are going to talk. So here's my third idea, that the first one was this piece of empathy. The second one was this piece of connection allowed and enabled by global digital networks and the microchip. And my third idea is technology has this amazing capacity to connect and disconnect, to amplify who we are and what we do. And we can do it very well or we can do it very poorly, but the technology picks it up and amplifies it. So what I want to really talk about, and I'm into my eighth minute, almost ninth minute of my talk, and that is I want to talk to you about the science of connection, the real connection, because I think while technology can do that and amplify our ability to communicate, actually what it does is it amplifies our ability to have access to one another, but it does not amplify our humanity. So what I want to talk about right now is my next point and next idea for you to consider. And that is to go back to my first idea, which is that if I cannot connect with you on a human level and you cannot connect with me, and we do not understand each other and do not have empathy for one another, how are we going to connect and exchange ideas truly? So with that in mind, what I'd like to share with you is some of the work that Peter and I have been doing with Success Lab, with our clients, with our families, with our friends, and anybody who cares to listen. And sometimes they don't. 
don't want to be disconnected from us, right? So what I'd like to share with you is some of the findings, and I want you to have some takeaways, something you can take away today and you can use on each other right away when you get out of here. And I want to talk to you about using the science of connection to say how can you amplify your humanity, be it through technology, be it through face-to-face, -face, be it with whoever, your friends, your family, your spouses, the community, uh, where you work. How many of you experience conflict? How many of you had children? <laughs> okay. How many of you experience not feeling particularly safe in certain situations? How many of you have gone into a situation where your hair stand up and you don't know why? Or you think something bad is going to happen? Some of you are just crazy. But, you know. <laughs> but, including myself. The point I want to make is that very telltale brain that developed the circuitry of us becoming homo sapiens and becoming incredibly able to mirror what other people are thinking, in the back of our brain is our primitive brain, the limbic system. So if there's any brain people in here, just excuse me, I'm really simplifying things. You don't want any technical stuff here. but. Here, this limbic system is incredible. It scans the environment all the time. And so what I want to share with you is that it has no rational thought. It can't really think. It feels. And what it feels is danger. It can't tell the difference between a rattlesnake and a really nasty boss. It's all the same. But it feels, so when your hair stand up, when you don't feel safe, and you're connecting with something or somebody, it's what we call the first breakdown of trust. So in our work, what we've discovered is that without safety, we cannot have effective communication. We cannot have effective connection. We cannot exchange ideas with ease. We make up. We tell lies. We say things we didn't mean or we pretend. So the fundamental cement, if you will, the glue, if you will, of effective connection between you and me and all of us is trust. And trust isn't just about safety and really feeling that we can be who we are and flourish in that, it has some other elements. But that safety piece is very incredible because in our brain, in the limbic system, is an alarm system, if you will. To just simplify it, it's a pair of um, amygdala. The ar amygdala is the word for almond in Latin. It's a little almond-shaped thing in each side of our, our hemisphere. This is the alarm system that goes off when we feel an incredible danger. And it's your emotional, it processes emotions, it processes memories and puts it all together and says, run, freeze, fight it out, do something. And then the mirror circuitry in here is looking and judging and it's very rational and it's saying, hey, it's just your boss, it's not a rattlesnake, calm down. This will, oops, I hope there's no bosses in here. <laughs> Maybe it's just your child or next door neighbor or something. But this kind of emotional stuff that comes up, this alarm system's going, and the mirror things here saying, trying to type in the code and say, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's just, it's okay. And this tussle, between us really impacts our ability to trust one another because we're now in a place where we cannot. So the first idea I want you to go away with is that trust is about making yourself safe and making others safe. And what happens when we're not safe is we actually, the limbic brain, 
cuts the supply of oxygen to your frontal system where rational thought occurs. It puts you in survival mode, takes the blood supply, diverts it away to get you ready to do all those running and freezing and fighting things. But if you breathe deeply and calm yourself down, you can get into the game and put some skin back into the game again. But it takes a little bit of time, so you have to know your triggers, what makes you get into what we call flooding or emotional hijacking. It's the word in um, emotional intelligence terms. There's different words, so that's the first thing. The second thing in trust is do you keep your word? Do you say what you're gonna say? Do you do it? So credibility and integrity, do you tell the truth? Do you tell it like it is? But all of these things, and then do you have the skills and the professional ability or to do what you said you were gonna do? But all of that trust piece is underlined by safety. If you're not safe, then it takes us into the second place, and that is how can I subvert my flooding and my safety needs and my credibility needs and do I have all this trust? Can I build trust with my people? And that is the place of really knowing that contempt, criticism, negative talk, passivity or violent behavior of aggression, they absolutely create flooding and the breakdown of trust and credibility and your integrity. So we know from science, and we know that there are three things you can do. I'll give you one of them right now. Appreciate. It's called uh, building social credit. I made that up. <laughs> building that credit where you appreciate, recognize, and are grateful to other people will be amazing in terms of building trust. So if you can write a note, most powerful thing you could do. Thank people for what they've done and recognize them for their contribution in your life, your work, your accomplishment. It will make a difference in building trust. Now, to finish off, I'd like to share with you the last piece and the last idea. And that is probably one of the most powerful most powerful ideas I can leave you with. Every culture on this planet, every race, every creed, every religion follows this one principle for human connection. We are taught it, we are forced to learn it, and God help you if you don't follow it. Because if you don't, sanctions will be placed against you, you'll be derided, called names, and the like. And this principle I learned through the readings and work and research of uh, Dr. Cialdini. He is one of the major researchers of influence. And this principle is that of social reciprocity. And this principle is not a principle. It is a social rule of homo sapiens. And it says this. If you do me a favor, I am obliged and indebted to you, and I need to do it back. I need to give back to you what you have given to me. And so I want to leave you with that. So this is for gifts, for favors, for requests. So if I ask you, will you help me, I am now reversing the rule. So it's better if I ask you, what can I do to help you? Because then I'm building up an obligation and a debt in you. And so as Cialdini says, and when people say, yeah, you'd, uh, you say that somebody did you a favor and you say, yeah, that's great. Thanks for doing me the favor. And the other person, what do they usually say when you do them a favor? Yeah, no problem. It's okay. You can seize that moment and say, that's great, Joe, or George, or Jessica. But you know what? If you were in my place, if you ever need that, you know what? I would do the same for you as you have done for me. If you do me a favor, 
and I say to you, thank you very much, you can turn around to me and say, great, I know that next time I'm in need, you will do the same for me. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Enjoy. Enjoy.